Russia's plan to end the war in Syria. After six years of fighting, is the Kremlin now in the diplomatic driver's seat? And is the White House taking a back seat? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Jane Dutton. Welcome to the programme. Russia's leader says a new stage has been set for a political solution to the war in Syria. Vladimir Putin has welcomed the presidents of Iran and Turkey to map out a strategy for when the fighting stops. Notably absent from the negotiating table, the United States. How much influence does President Donald Trump have over Putin when it comes to Syria? And can peace really be achieved with Bashar al-Assad still in power? We'll discuss this and more with our guests in a moment. But first, Roy Challens reports from Sochi in southern Russia. The war in Syria is nearly over, said the three presidents meeting in Sochi. Now, they urge it's time to rebuild the shattered country. And Vladimir Putin thinks a plan he's been pushing for weeks now is gaining momentum. I am satisfied by the fact that the presidents of Iran and Turkey have supported an initiative to hold an all-Syrian forum, a congress of national dialogue in Syria. The Kremlin-driven initiative aims to bring a broad spectrum of Syrian governments, opposition and civil society groups to Sochi in early December to plan for the country's future. We have all talked about our positions. All three countries have spoken in favour of convening this Congress of National Dialogue here in Sochi. But President Erdogan has been telling Putin he won't accept Kurdish groups linked to the PKK being there. And Turkey's president still seems lukewarm on the idea. Let me agree with President Putin, as he said we need to build on the momentum achieved. As we talked together with Mr Rouhani, we agreed that we need to extend our ties in all the areas. Even less enthusiastic is the Syrian opposition group, the HNC, which says it refuses to discuss the future of Syria outside the UN's Geneva framework. At an opposition conference beginning in the Saudi capital, Riyadh, early indications are that groups will keep their insistence Assad must go, despite pressure to compromise. With its plan for a Congress of National Dialogue, Russia seems keen to shape the political future of Syria, much like it's already shaped the conflict. If Putin's successful, this will be to the benefit of his ally Assad, and yet again the dreams of the opposition will suffer. Rory Challens, Al Jazeera, Sochi. Let's now get the thoughts of our guests joining us in Moscow. Pavel Felgenhauer, he's a Russia defence and foreign policy analyst in Oxford. Samuel Romani, PhD candidate at the University of Oxford. Samuel is a specialist on Russia and Middle East affairs and is a regular contributor to The Diplomat and Washington Post. And via Skype in Rome, Basam Imadi, ambassador of the Syrian National Coalition to Italy. A very warm welcome to the three of you. Basam Imadi, Russia's plan, can it work? Do you like it? Well, uh, you see, the plan of Russia is actually to change the main track, the international track, agreed upon by the Security Council uh, in uh, Resolution 2254. It stipulated that the uh, peace process should start in Geneva under the uh, uh, United Nations facilitation. And this has been going on for, for some time. Unfortunately, the regime did not want to negotiate. Russia is supporting the regime. Now, what is, what, what is, uh, what is happening now in Sochi is an attempt by Russia to change this, to uh, hijack the peace, uh, peace process from Geneva and changing it into Sochi, to take it there, to Sochi. Now, the problem is that uh, in Sochi, they are going to invite uh, about 1,000 or more than that uh, from Syria and from outside. But they will invite more people uh, 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 who are supporting Bashar Assad than opposition 
who, who started the revolution in the first place. So I think that this conference will only be uh, a ploy to avoid the international legitimacy decided by the United Nations. Uh, they did that before, by the way, in Astana. They separated the military track from the diplomatic track. And they took uh, the help of Turkey by pressuring the military groups to attend Astana. Actually, the, the military groups didn't have any role. They just attended uh, to witness what was happening. The whole thing was devised by Russia and Iran and Turkey. But Pavel Falgan, how are you different. as cynical when it comes to the Russian plan? I'm wondering what you make of the Russian plan, or if it's just a plan to push Russia to the front of everything that's happening in Syria at the moment. Well, uh, Syria is just a, a part of the big game that's happening in the Middle East, and well, not only in the Middle East. Uh, for Russia, the main thing is to build an anti-American coalition with Iran and uh, hopefully with Turkey on the basis of this uh, Syrian campaign. Of course, uh, Iran and Russia are already kind of anti-American. Russian military boasts that by deploying forces in Syria, Russia outflanked NATO. Uh, but uh, the uh, ultimate goal would be to po possibly pull Turkey away from the United States and NATO. Uh, and of course, uh, Syria is important because uh, Assad is important for Russia because he can guarantee that Russia will retain a uh, military naval base on the Syrian Mediterranean coast and even more importantly, an air base there. So this is just part of it. And uh, Russia is using what's happening right now in Syria to promote its overall strategic intentions, which are even much wider than the entire Middle East. Samuel Romani, this plan, it seems, when you listen to both of these guests, has got very little to do with Syria. It's rather uh, pushing Russia to the forefront and getting rid of the U.S. there. I think that this is aimed at more than just a ploy for Syria and control over bases and control over tactical assets there, or just removing the U.S. from Syria. By using Russia's unique status as having a relatively favorable relationship with Iran and Saudi Arabia and a wide range of other regional stakeholders, combined with their outreach to both the Kurds and to the Syrian government and to a handful of Syrian opposition factions, Russia is trying to demonstrate that it is able to preserve and enhance collective security in the entire Middle East and is using the success in Syria, possibly as a precedent for future interventions in Yemen, the Saudi Arabia, Iran, the diplomatic standoff, and with Qatar. So I think that this is a very significant step for Russia. Russia is using this as a benchmark, and there's a lot at stake for them. Pavel, you mentioned the reasons why Russia would get involved, also from a geopolitical point of view. But what about Putin trying to reinstate himself as an international hard hitter and to divert attention away from the insurgency in his own country? Well, actually, it was rather a pragmatic move, which happened in the uh, last several years, beginning from 08, from the Russian war, a short war with Georgia, uh, when NATO uh, naval forces went into the Black Sea and dominated it, and uh, Ru the Russian military are doing to trying to do their best that that would never happen again. That means moving out into the Mediterranean, moving out into the Middle East, gaining uh, military bases and allies in the Middle East, building bridges with American allies, even with, with Israel and with Saudi Arabia, and especially with Turkey, which is preoccupied, of course, right now, mostly with the Kurds, the Kurds in Syria, the Kurds in Turkey itself. And uh, uh, Erdogan, of course, is preoccupied with also with his internal opposition in Turkey. And he's uh, uh, very much annoyed by the United States refusing to extradite uh, Gulen from uh, who he believes is his arch enemy from America. So Russia is using that. So this is a kind of defensive push, but it's uh, trying to push Russia's strategic defensive lines as far away from Russia, from the Caucasus, deeper into the Middle East, into the Mediterranean, which is a very uh, uh, traditional Russian strategy strategy coming from times of the Tsars, actually. But so how do Syrians feel about Russia basically being given the go-ahead to be in the diplomatic driver's seat here when it comes to peace in the country? I don't think she, uh, Russia is given that role. Russia, as your guest said, is trying to reimpose itself on the area. The problem yeah, with, but uh, it the seems Syrian that they have been Russia. given the go-ahead, haven't they? I mean, certainly the U.S. has step back uh, and there's nobody else doubtful that they are, the charge? Uh, 
you are right that Americans uh, have been passive vis-a-vis -vis the Syrian issue. Uh, they have been sitting in the, in, the, in the back seat, but we don't know. They now uh, uh, try to take uh, the, the northeast of Syria and have some bases there. They already have done so. And we don't know what's going to happen. We have uh, a, a statement from the spokesman in the White House uh, telling uh, indirectly Russia that your conference in Sochi is not going to work because he hinted to the uh, international legitimacy in Geneva. Anyway, uh, for the Syrians, Russia's intervention is the one thing that prevented Assad from falling down. And therefore, we consider Russia as an enemy because we, uh, the aspiration of the Syrian people is to go back to normal life after 40 years of dictatorship. They have re revolted against this regime. And they are going to, go to, to continue that. Neither Russia nor any other power is going to stop them from getting their freedom back. So Russia is not going to succeed in that conference because the real Syrian opposition forces and revolutionary forces will not attend that. And without them, they cannot go on with this diplomatic solution. Yeah, Samuel, that is a problem, isn't it? The Syrian opposition will not accept Assad remaining in power, and it seems that he is not going anywhere. So how do you get around that? Is it time for the opposition to say, right, we get it, he's not going to go, let's compromise on that issue? I think that this is a very uh, difficult problem. It's probably the biggest one. I think that there are, however, a lot of divisions that exist within the Syrian opposition. So Stefan de Mistura, the UN representative for Syria, urged the opposition to appear united. But apparently that has not been the case. I mean, Ziad Ajib, who was the Saudi representative, has openly resigned from it, which has been praised by the Russians as like a victory against extremism because he categorically wants no dialogue with Assad. But there's some other factions of the opposition, whether they be some members of the SDF, some members of the moderate opposition who are concerned about al-Nusra's rise in, in Idlib and some other areas who could be open to dialogue and could be open to negotiation. But that being said, I think Russia has seen a lot like the United States has seen in the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's seen as a, a stakeholder that's pretending to be indifferent but actually has vested interests. And I think that the lack of unity and the divisions between the, the, the branches in Saudi Arabia, the branches in Egypt, the branches in Qatar, the domestic branches in Damascus, all these factions within the Syrian opposition, and the fighting even amongst the even amongst the Kurdish factions, even amongst others, makes this very makes the agreement on whether it's had to go or stay very difficult. As of now, the loss of international support and their loss of territory would rationally push them into a direction of a political settlement and a ceasefire, like which is the combined goal. But I think that there's often an absence and dearth of rationality coming from various factions in the opposition. Let's talk, Pavel, a little bit more about divisions in the country and who gets what and who gets what spoils. I mean, how does that conversation develop? Is it something that Assad's regime should say, all right, the opposition can keep control of Deir Ezzor, for example, or is he in a position where he doesn't have to compromise? Uh, well, Moscow would want him to compromise and take on board as much of the opposition as possible. Uh, the Russian military officers that are working on the so-called deconflicting zones, uh, they are using more or less the same tactics as the Russians used in uh, the Northern Caucasus in quelling the Chechen uh, uh, opposition and uh, separatism kind of recruiting within the opposition, recruiting uh, uh, fighters in the opposition, t making them turn coat and integrating them. Uh, the As because, but because of the fraction, uh, no, very fractional uh, situation in Syria uh, with different uh, religious and ethnic groups, that's very hard to do. Uh, the um, uh, pro-Iranian forces don't want to see the Sunnis much around. The Alawites have their own interests. Uh, everyone has his own interests, and so it's quite frustrating quite often for the Russian operatives on the ground to persuade the Assad regime and other allies, the, the Iranian-led militias, to begin to kind of integrate with parts of the opposition. But that would be basically the Russian goal. Russia has a very clear strategic goal and believes that it has clear tactical ways of achieving it. The main problem, uh, unlike, unlike the United States, it doesn't apparently have any kind of clear view what it really wants to achieve. Yeah, I mean, the, Samuel, the main that's, that's problem a good point, with Russia isn't it? Doesn't so can, have enough let me resources. bring Samuel in here. I mean, where is the U.S. here? 
I mean, they are notable by their absence. We know that Donald Trump has placed a few calls, but clearly Syria is not top of his agenda. Is that a mistake for the U.S. to be so removed at this time? I think it is a mistake, yes, for the U.S. to be involved and to not be involved in this conflict to, to the extent that it should. But I also think that Russia is deliberately trying to make this uh, negotiations in a way that's very, very not amenable to the United States. So much like the way they're holding talks in Afghanistan right now, they're including the Taliban and excluding the U.S., they're also not, they're also starting to break themselves and distance themselves from some U.S.-backed opposition factions, like the SDF. Russia has noticeably been distancing themselves from them because of uh, issues with, some, with Arabs leaving and some others leaving in internal conflicts. I mean, there's been a lot of provocative actions from the Russian side that are making the U.S. not want to intervene. That being said, I think the United States should use its leverage over, over Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, external actors who continue to be either on the fence or backing Syrian opposition to kind of urge their respective opposition groups who are working within those countries to push for a political settlement. And that has not been done by Trump. And I think that that is a, a big problem. Bassam, if, as you suggested earlier on, all the opposition or whoever goes to the table are either sycophants or they've bought into uh, Russia's plan are attending, then what sort of compromises do you think would be played out here? And where do you think Russia, uh, sorry, the US should be sitting in this scenario? What would the Syrians like to see on, on all sides? The only thing acceptable by the Syrian people, not only opposition, I'm talking about all Syrians from all sects, all religious uh, groups, whatever what your guests talk about. They are united on one thing, that Assad must go. A man after killing one million people, destroying 80% of the country and uh, detaining half a million people. How can you imagine that such a person could go on ruling the country? It's not a matter of few seats in this ministry or that ministry. It's a matter of the future of the whole Syrian people, generations who have given up their life because they were uh, trying to fight against this dictatorship. Now, the only thing acceptable by Syrians is the removal of that person. If Russia is not able to deliver that, Nothing will happen. It will go on. It will get stuck in the war. And I think that the U.S. let it go in that swamp, to, to, to drown in that stump, swamp, because without removing Assad, nothing will happen. And the Iranians are insisting on keeping Assad in power because without him, Iran would not have anything in Syria. They have invested a lot. And he's the only one who could keep that investment. Russia is, is on the same level. They have also invested a lot. And the only person who would give them as much as he gave is, 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 is Bashar Assad. Don't I mean, Pavel, it's quite a statement, isn't gas. it, to Syrians and the world, that this man who is accused and linked of killing hundreds of thousands of people remains in power. I mean, he is the uh, legitimate leader now, the man to do business with. Yes, of course, for Russia, Assad is seen as essential. Uh, Putin embraced him uh, in person in Sochi. Uh, just a day ago, and uh, the Russian uh, military intelligence community has been working with the Assad family and uh, its kind of uh, circle of uh, uh, military intelligence people since uh, a long time ago, for 40 years. There's a lot of very much interaction, personal interaction. Many of those people and those generals are known to Russians, uh, st trained in Russian military academies. So keeping the, uh, Assad and also keeping uh, the Assad family uh, uh, hierarchy of military in intelligence and security people, that's seen as uh, the only guarantee that Russia could get that Syria is going to be a reliable Russian base in its kind of grand standoffs with the United States and the Mediterranean and the Middle Eastern re region. So Russia is not giving up Assad. The main problem of the Russian effort in Syria actually is uh, that we don't have sufficient resources, especially uh, resources to rebuild Syria, economic and financial. And without rebuilding, there will be no peace there at all. I know they've called on the international community to help them rebuild a new... I guess want to say, well, it's your problem. I mean, there's a real concern about corruption, uh, Samuel, in the Assad government, that if you give them humanitarian aid, it's to, it, it is going to get to the wrong people. But that's looking far ahead, isn't it? I mean, we've still got to deal with Turkey's issues, for example. I mean, that seems to be the most reluctant partner there of that uh, 
three-way meeting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the corruption issue is obviously very large. I mean, the United Nations has been working directly with the Syrian government, and 88% of the humanitarian supplies that have been going have been going to the government-held territories, with very little being given to the opposition territories. So that is a big problem. Turning to Turkey, I absolutely agree with you. Turkey stands as the most ambiguous of all the great powers in this area. While Russia and Iran have kind of framed this uh, the victory in Syria to be a conflict against extremism, Turkey has emphasized the end to, uh, has distanced itself from this talk of Islamic extremism, has focused on ending the bloodletting and ending the, and creating a settlement. But in reality, it is actually encouraging a lot of the bloodletting. It is uh, inter wanting to intervene militarily in Afrin, and it's doing so with covert Russian support possibly now, which is not something that the Russians would have probably backed a few months, a few months ago. So until Turkey can recognize, like either with Russia's proposal of creating, renaming Syria as from Syrian Arab Republic to a Syrian Republic, genuinely include the Kurds and Kurdish groups within that constitutional framework, then they're actually acting as a saboteur rather than as a advancer of peace. Bassam, ultimately, one would think that this is all about bringing peace to the country and for refugees to return. What do you think it's going to take for refugees to return? And how do you think they've determined that the war is nearly over? Is it the, the sheer scale of destruction, the number of people who've died? I mean, what was the key there? The key, as I just mentioned before, if Russia is capable of getting asset out, all, all things could be negotiated. And by the way, this is one of the main uh, uh, conditions for rebuilding the country by the West or by other countries anyway. Uh, the problem is that, as you mentioned yourself, the corruption in the country. Now we have seen some money has been given back to Aleppo to rebuild the country, the, the, the destroyed city. And the regime has taken this money to rebuild the areas which are allied to the regime rather than those which were destroyed. Uh, so, again, the key to the problem is the removing of Assad. Uh, the refugees are, of course, waiting to return, but they will not return while this regime is on. Those people who came back to Aleppo, some of them, you know, there are very few, they have been tortured, they have been arrested by by Assad, and so many atrocities have been uh, done to them. Therefore, people would not go back if Assad is, there, is staying there. So the key is actually to remove Assad. And as I said before, it's a removal not only of Assad himself, but all his security apparatuses, uh, all his uh, military leaders who have been committing all these atrocities and war crimes against the Syrian people. Samuel, it seems that peace is as far away now as when the war started despite the, or in spite of the Russian pan as well that's been proposed. There doesn't really seem to be anything that's going to be able to unlock all the factors to bring all the key players to the table. Exactly. I mean, I feel like the peace is very far away, and in part because there's so much factionalism, and factionalism is being fomented by individual opposition and uh, extra-regional actors. I mean, al Nusra is blatantly arming rival factions and causing them to fight against each other, and they control Idlib, and they control large quantities of of, of opposition territory now, and they're, and they're a major force that neither power is able to, to deal with. And there's countless other instances in which Russia is reaching out, as Pavel said, to train uh, tribes and tribal leaders in che Chechen style and try to pull them over. But they're prying them away from the areas like in Shirat, where there's oil and gas and where there's other types of things, and doing nothing for other tribes. So there's a kind of like a sectarianism within a sectarianism that's existing in Syria. That's very worrying. And no great power, regional power, or e internal actor is being able to deal with this. So I think the peace is very far away, as long as Assad wants to use violence, as long as the opposition remains disunited. This, this Pavel, you wanted to say something briefly, if you will? Oh, very briefly. It's, um, ISIS is off the board, at least as a quasi-state and a major military force, though it's, of course, will continue as a terrorist organization, surely. And uh, ISIS was the uniting factor. Everyone was against ISIS. With that uniting factor out, now there's no common goal, and everyone is going to follow his own interest, all the outside powers, and actually inside Syria, different fractions too. So the situation is actually more fractured and more unpredictable than it was before. Pavel Falgenhauer, thank you very much for those final comments. Samuel Romani, you too, and Bassam Imadi, thank you very much. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. Mine is at Jane Dutton. And from me and the rest of the team, bye for now.